Good morning, and as always, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Thank you so much for attending this uh, webinar organized by the Global Virus Network. And uh, as always, just as a reminder, uh, maybe some of you, the attendees, do not exactly know what the GVN is about. The Global Virus Network is a network of now around 68 centers all around the world and I believe something like 20 affiliate centers uh, created in 2011 by Bob Gallo and Bill, Billy Hall and also Reinhard Kurt. And um, this is a network which is really based on science, which is independent, these are keywords, and which is focused on coordinating research activities, one, second on education, and training those who are interested you can have a look to our website with the GVN Academy program which is being uh, developed and free advocacy communication overall we provide expertise we have also task force we have it comes as no surprise a task force on COVID-19 and in particular meetings at regular time intervals and all of you who are interested in these activities you are most welcome to contact us. And uh, today, it's really a great pleasure to welcome David Ostrov. David is Associate Professor in the Department of Pathology, Immunology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of Florida. And uh, he has been trained at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle, and then went for a postdoc in the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He has been working with Stan Nathanson at that time. And David's career has been very much focused about structural analysis and correlation between biological activities and structure, structure function. And he moved to the University of Florida in uh, 2002. He has been again involved in some structural, structural studies such as the one on the first drug HLA complex structure resolved by X-ray crystallography. Uh, and he has a huge experience on screening <coughs> large chemical libraries and looking for drug candidates. And it is really in this context that we went to connect. And it has been a pleasure to interact with David, who has been actively contributing to the uh, GVN activities and uh, to the GVN COVID-19 task force. So we really very much uh, look forward to his lecture today. Thank you, David. Thank you so much, Christian. I agree. It is indeed a pleasure to interact with the Global Virus Network. Can you all see my screen? So what I want to do today is first talk about some of the work that we had done trying to find small molecules that bind ACE2, which as many of most of you I'm sure know is the main receptor for SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about our work, including one of the drugs that we found that bound ACE2 called hydroxyzine, an old antihistamine. Then I wanna talk about how in 2020, there were searches for FDA approved drugs with activity against SARS-CoV-2, and that pointed towards drugs that bind certain receptors called sigma receptors. And that search even included certain antihistamines. Then I wanna talk more about specific antihistamines and antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. And then finally, I, I want to talk about the sigma receptor and what signals actually drive antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. So ACE2, as many of you probably know, is a zinc metalloprotease whose main function is to regulate blood pressure. It cleaves vasoconstrictive peptides and generates vasodilatory peptides. That's its main job. 
And back in 2002, I was asked if we could find small molecules that would bind the active site of ACE2 and would act as ACE2 inhibitors. And so we screened more than 100,000 molecules for their ability to bind the active site of ACE2. And we found ACE2 inhibitors. And around that time, it was discovered that SARS used ACE2 to get into cells. And so we asked, is it possible that any of our ACE2 inhibitors could actually interfere with the interaction between the spike protein from SARS and ACE2? And I thought this was not very likely to occur, but it actually worked. We actually were able to show that we could inhibit the interaction of the spike protein of SARS and ACE2 with a compound that we identified because it bound to ACE2. Um, we then tried to find activators of ACE2. We wanted to see if we could enhance the catalytic activity of ACE2. So we screened more than 100,000 molecules for their ability to bind three separate structural sites on either the open or closed conformation of ACE2. And we found what we were looking for and we published our data um, in 2007 on the activators. Then we, we looked specifically for FDA approved drugs that would bind ACE2. And we found some, including hydroxyzine. And we published this work in 2011. Um, and then I really stopped thinking very much about ACE2 um, and was thinking more about other topics until uh, COVID. Um, and back you know, in January of 2020, like everybody, we knew next to nothing. But eventually we found out that this was uh, a SARS-like coronavirus, which uses ACE2 to get into cells. And so I immediately thought we should try to develop monoclonal antibodies that interfere with the binding of ACE2 and the spike protein, make antibodies that bind right at the interface. We should try to develop new vaccines. We should try to identify small molecule drugs that have antiviral activity against ACE2. And we should also think ahead about making new chemical entities um, that have enhanced optimized activity against SARS-CoV-2. And I won't be talking about these topics today, but there has been movement in this area. We were able to generate monoclonal antibodies that bind the interface of ACE2 and uh, the spike protein. Um, and then we actually asked, can we use this peptide that corresponds to the most important part of the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, can we use th that as an immunogen in a vaccine to elicit T and B cells and protect mice from COVID? And it appears that we can, but, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. Today, let's talk about small molecules. So what proteins represent the best targets for antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2? Many people around the world were asking this question and a landmark paper on this topic was published from, UC, from a large group, including it was mainly UCSF people. And what they did in this paper published in Nature um, was they expressed almost every SARS-CoV-2 protein with a tag in HEC-293 cells so that they could identify all of the human proteins that would interact with all of the viral proteins. And they created a map, a, a protein interaction map with the mouse and human proteins. And when they identified these proteins, these 66 proteins, then they asked, we know certain drugs bind these proteins. Can we use drugs that bind these proteins and see if they inhibit antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2? And they did. And they found compounds, many of which were approved that had activity against SARS-CoV-2 in Vero E6 cells. So, th so this was in vitro. And if you looked at all of the drugs that they found, they seemed to fall into two categories. One category was inhibitors of mRNA translation. And the other is regulators of sigma-1 and sigma-2 receptors. So from a drug discovery standpoint, inhibitors of mRNA translation, that doesn't sound like the best 
um, strategy for uh, drug development, you know, general inhibition of mRNA, but regulators of sigma-1 and sigma-2 receptors, I, I was really confused because I didn't know hardly anything about sigma-1 or sigma-2 receptors, but fortunately, um, there is expertise um, at the University of Florida, thanks to Chris McCurdy, who is here on this um, call. Um, so the UCSF group that the SARS-CoV-2 protein NSP6 bounds bound the sigma-1 receptor and ORF9C bound the sigma-2 receptor. And so keep in mind, UCSF found that drugs that bind sigma receptors have antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2, including antihistamines, these antihistamines, and they discuss in their paper that antihistamines that bind sigma receptors have antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. Antihistamines that don't have sigma receptor binding activity don't have activity against SARS-CoV-2. So this really made me think that sigma receptors could be important players. And just to let's think a little bit more now about sigma receptors, what are they? Sigma receptors are ER membrane proteins that have a diverse set of physiological roles, including modulating cell stress. And we know that coronaviruses, not just SARS-CoV-2, replicate in specialized compartment that buds off from the ER. And the coronavirus-induced stress helps to form this compartment. And this is the compartment where, where SARS-CoV-2 can replicate. Sigma receptors, and I thank Chris McCurdy for this, this introductory slide. Um, this uh, Sigma receptors were originally thought to be opioid receptors because of their profound effect on pain, but they were, they're clearly not opioid receptors. And you will, if you look at the literature, you'll find a lot of people do research on Sigma receptors um, in the area of pain and addiction. And which is why Chris has been studying sigma receptors. Um, there are two types of sigma receptors, so-called sigma-1 and sigma-2. The sigma receptors are expressed at different levels in different cell types and in different physiolo physiological conditions, such as cancer. Um, but if you look, if you ask globally about the RNA, it's ubiquitously expressed. It's, it's detected in all cells. Uh, sigma-1 and sigma-2, according to the protein atlas. S the sigma-1 receptor is on the ER, and it's located in the ER where the ER contacts mitochondria at the so-called mitochondrion-associated ER membrane, the MAM. That's where it's located. What happens when signals are transmitted through the sigma-1 receptor? calcium mobiliz mobilization, calcium mobilization at the MAM. It's important to think that when an agonist binds the sigma-1 receptor, this influences the interaction of the sigma-1 receptor with an important protein called BIP, the immunoglobulin binding protein BIP, also known as GRP78. Agonist binding promotes the dissociation, the movement of BIP. Antagonist binding enhances the association of BIP. And people in the audience might know, but BIP is a well-known heat shock protein with chaperone activities. So it's, it, it will be involved with trafficking within the cell. And it also has important anti-inflammatory properties when it's released from cells. So just, the, the, I, I think these are all important things to think about in terms of the mechanism of action. The sigma-2 receptors actually, e even though both molecules are mysterious, the sigma-2 receptor is even less well characterized than sigma-1. Um, a crystal structure of sigma-2 was recently solved. Um, it was solved after we, we published this work. Um, but there is limited, less, it, it's less easy to, measure the activity of uh, selective agonists and antagonists in the sigma-2 receptor system, as I understand it. These are very difficult experiments to conduct. So this question was really sticking in my mind. Why is it 
that these sigma receptor ligands exhibit activity against SARS-CoV-2. But in, at this time in 2020, we were thinking about ACE2 binding drugs in SARS-CoV-2. And so thanks to um, my colleagues here, Ashley Brown, Leah Reznikoff, and, and Michael Resn or Mike Norris, who really played the, the most significant role by far in, in this work by working in BSL-3 with the live isolates of SARS-CoV-2. Um, thanks to them, we were able to answer the question about whether the ACE2 drugs inhibit SARS-CoV-2 or not. And if you, we tested a number of ACE2 binding drugs that we previously found, and only one of them had antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. That, that suggests to me that it's not the ACE2 binding property that this compound has, that this drug has. Um, it's, it's probably exerting its mecha mechanism of action through something else. And that drug is hydroxyzine. So um, Mike showed that a particular isolate was inhibited uh, by hydroxyzine. And Ashley Brown showed that a different isolate was inhibited um, by hydroxyzine, hydroxyzine in a completely different lab in a different part of the state. Um, so it was pretty clear that hydroxyzine has antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I do not believe that the mechanism of action is by binding to ACE2 because the affinity of ACE2 for the spike protein is much higher than the affinity of the ACE2 for the spike protein of the original SARS. So it's really a tight affinity. I don't think these drugs are interfering with that interaction. I think it's something else. And I think it's sigma receptors. Um, so in 2020, there were three antihistamines that were published in Nature to have antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. And we found hydroxyzine. So in my mind, there were four antihistamines with antiviral activity. Um, so some, but not all, have antiviral activity. There, there's some specificity to something else. It's, that's not the histamine receptor. Most of these drugs are not very common. And, most, and all of them are prescribed. Um, and I had to wonder, are there commonly used antihistamines that might actually have direct antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. And uh, people on this call in, in the Global Virus Network COVID-19 task force meetings might remember that I asked people if, if they could help me find out this information. And eventually I connected to somebody at UCSF who was able to help, Atul Boot. And I asked him if he could look up the electronic medical records of people that were tested for SARS-CoV-2 and used common antihistamines to, and, and calculate the association between usage of the drug and a positive SARS-CoV-2 test. And this was the data that he sent. And really, you might want to pay attention to the statistics statistical significance and the odds ratio. If the statistical significance is point, less than 0 0.05, it might be uh, significant. Now the odds ratio here describes the strength of association between usage of a drug and a positive test for, for COVID. If the, if the number in this column is one, that means there's no association between using the drug and, and testing positive. If the number in that column is two, that means if you're twice as likely to, to test positive for COVID if you took that drug. If the number is 0.5, that means you're 50% less likely to test positive for COVID. Now look at this table and look at diphenhydramine and look at statistical significance. 10 to the minus 10, I, I could not help but wonder. It, you know, when you see statistical significance like that, there has to be a reason that reason might have nothing to do with what you think it is, but there must be some reason. There might be many confounding factors, but is it even remotely possible that diphenhydramine could have antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2? So we did the experiment, Leah and, and Mike, 
Mike Norris. And it's very clear. Hydroxyzine exhibits antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. Diphenhydramine exhibits antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2, and it's even a little bit better than hydroxyzine. And azelastine, a third generation antihistamine, is even better. It's active at an even lower concentration in terms of inhibiting SARS-CoV-2 activity. These two drugs, hydroxyzine and diphenhydramine, were experimentally determined to bind the sigma-1 receptor. And azelastine is predicted to bind sigma-1, which is what you see right here. Now, we went back to the people in UCSF and, and showed them this data and, and asked if they wanted to publish. And they thought, maybe we should take a deeper look at this. Maybe we should take a look at a larger population and see if these associations hold up. So what they did was they looked in more than 219,000 people in the UCSF health system that were tested for SARS-CoV-2 and they looked at the usage of the drugs. And what they found was statistical significant associations with the drugs that have the direct antiviral activity, hydroxyzine, diphenhydramine, and azelastine. And here the odds ratio describes the strength of association between a drug and a negative test. So here, for example, for diphenhydramine, if you were over the age of 61 in this population of more than 219,000, and you use diphenhydramine, you were less likely to get COVID. You were less likely to test positive for COVID. How much less likely? You were 65% less likely to test positive for COVID. That's what this number means right here. In other words, if you took diphenhydramine and if you were over the age of 61, you were more likely than not not to test positive for COVID. Now, there could be many confounding factors. And a group at the University of Florida wrote a paper on this topic for confounding factors that could influence that number. I personally am much more interested in the actual antiviral activity of these drugs that bind sigma receptors. Do they exert their antiviral activity because they somehow block, let's say, NSP6 sigma-1 receptor interactions? Are they blockers of sigma-1? Or do they actually drive signals through the sigma-1 receptor like an agonist? And that's what's driving the antiviral activity. You know, is it antagonism or agonism of sigma-1? And what about sigma-2? Is sigma-2 ligation sufficient for it to drive antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2? And what is the role of sigma-1 versus sigma-2? Is it better to, to engage them both? Thanks to Chris McCurdy, we could answer these questions because in his lab, he has these tools. Um, he developed many of these tools himself. Um, so for agonism of the sigma-1 receptor, in his lab, he has a, a highly selective sigma-1 receptor agonist. That, that Mike Norris could test and see if it drives antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. What about antagonism of the sigma-1 receptor? Chris developed a highly selective antagonist of the sigma-1 receptor. So we could see what happens if we prevent signaling through sigma-1. What about sigma-2? Chris developed a highly, he built, since he's a medicinal chemist, he built a highly selective sigma-2 receptor ligand. What about ligation of sig sigma-1 and sigma-2 at the same time? Chris has such a ligand in his lab that he has done extensive work on and was involved in the, the generation of. Um, so, what are the answers to these questions? These answers could be um, shown with experiments by taking Vero E6 cells and asking if these compounds drive antiviral activity. And the answers are shown on the next slide. Let's start with the sigma-1 receptor antagonist. 
what you're looking at on the y-axis is killing of Vero E6 cells by SARS-CoV-2, by SARS-CoV-2 isolate. And you can see that as you add increasing concentrations of the antagonist, there's no killing. There, there's no effect on killing. The cells are killed. There, there's no inhibition of killing. The antagonist has no antiviral activity at all. What about the sigma-1 receptor agonist? What happens if you drive a signal through sigma-1? Antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. Very clear result. What about the sigma-2 receptor? What if you engage sigma-2 and not sigma-1? Antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. Sigma-2 receptor ligation drives SARS-CoV-2 activity. It's either directly or indirectly associated with inhibiting SARS-CoV-2 activity. What about engagement of both sigma-1 and sigma-2? You also get antiviral activity. Is it better? If you look at replication, it looks like engagement of sigma-1 and sigma-2 is better. So what you're looking at here is replication of SARS-CoV-2, and you're looking at it being knocked down by the sigma-2 selective ligand, and it's knocked down even more when you engage sigma-1 and sigma-2. And engagement of sigma-1 and sigma-2 also is very potent at, at reducing plaque formation, as shown here. Now, during this time, I was paying attention to what was happening at the Global Virus Network meetings and seminars, um, including in th this series, and, and the one well, 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 before I get to that, let me, let me hit another topic. Um, I see where I should probably finish soon. Can this information be used to generate new chemical entities? The short answer to the question, I believe, is yes. If you look at a sigma-1 receptor agonist that exhibits antiviral activity and compare it to a sigma-1 receptor antagonist, which does not have antiviral activity. By molecular docking, it seems logical to conclude that interaction of ligands with these amino acids in the sigma-1 receptor would be advantageous in, in terms of having a sigma-1 receptor agonist. So in other words, if you're trying to build a new chemical entity with a lead compound, that had sigma-1 receptor binding activity, and you knew that it bound, but it didn't engage these amino acids, you could um, build analogs that would interact with these amino acids that could be new chemical entities. Could you use the same rationale to design new chemical entities for the sigma-2 receptor? I believe the answer is yes. At the time that we did the study, we, we, the crystal structure was not solved, so we, um, we, we, create, we, we modeled the sigma-2 receptor based on the, the most similar structure that has been solved, which you see here on the left. And we took an educated guess at the location of the ligand binding site based on the crystal structure of the most similar protein whose structure was solved to sigma-2, which is this EBP protein. And so here on the right, you see our model of sigma-2 receptor and the ligand binding site and if you model ligands that exert antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2, you can identify the amino acids that those um, antiviral uh, compounds bind to. And so once again, this information could be useful for generating new chemical entities um, that bind sigma-1 and sigma-2. Um, and I will say that I'm happy to say that after the crystal structure was solved, um, I took a look at the UCSF paper, and it looks like the, the ligand binding site that they found in their crystal structure is the same site that you see here. So I, our, our modeling was not that bad. So let me um, finish up by talking about lactoferrin, which is um, something that I heard about from this seminar series from the Global Virus Network. And I heard about it when it was unpublished. Uh, Jonathan Sexton at the University of Michigan told in this seminar series about four, at least four drugs that had 
antiviral activity um, against SARS-CoV-2 in Vero E6 cells, much like what I was talking about before, but I think they were just doing it, trying to churn through them all, like all approved drugs. And they found lactoferrin to be their most promising um, hit. Um, and I could not help but think lactoferrin is available as an over-the-counter product and it exerts antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. What happens if we put it together with diphenhydramine, which is also an over-the-counter product that has activity against SARS-CoV-2? Could there be combined effects? Could they be additive? This would be good. Could, could there even be synergistic effects by combining them together as sometimes there can be? Um, and Mike Norris conducted the assay and was able to show um, reproducibly synergistic activity between diphenhydramine and lactoferrin against SARS-CoV-2 in vitro, not only in Vero E6 cells, but in lung epithelial cells that were forced to express ACE2. Um, and here you can actually see the engagement of the sigma-2 receptor inhibited SARS-CoV-2 in the lung epithelial cells, but engagement of sigma-1 and sigma-2 did even better. Um, but the combination of diphenhydramine and lactoferrin was better than, than either one on its own. Um, so let me just finish by uh, saying, by summarizing the main points that I'm trying to get across. Our data suggests a model in which sigma receptor agonism can drive antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. Sigma-2 receptor ligation can also drive antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2 in this model. And dual ligation, ligation of both sigma-1 and sigma-2 increases the antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. And we believe that new chemical entities can be generated that have properties that have been optimized um, and they, that can be tested in vitro and in vivo. And um, before I, I, I finish, I just want to say a few words. I, I'm really pleased that this work um, will be uh, in the print version of the article um, and, uh, and, and the, the featured cover um, article. So like we're going to have the cover and you know be the featured article of this journal, um, but it was released to the public about six weeks ago, and I just want to share to this group that almost every day for the last six weeks I have been contacted by people around the world um, with testimonials about how they have been taking diphenhydramine and lactoferrin um, or milk. And I've gotten a, a wide variety of, of testimonials, but most of them go along the lines of this. Everyone around me got, got COVID. I think that the reason I didn't get COVID has something to do with the fact that I take Benadryl and milk, or I take Benadryl and lactoferrin. Um, and as you might imagine, pe people are asking, they're saying, how much should I take and where can I get it? Um, and I think this is a little dangerous because I, I'm actually more worried about people, uh, about adverse effects that come from taking lactoferrin compared to diphenhydramine. Since lactoferrin is an iron binding protein, people seem inclined to, to want to take large amounts of it. Um, but I, I just wanted to share that with people. And, and I have thoughts on how to move forward with this. Um, I, I was getting a little bit tired of talking about diphenhydramine and lactoferrin, people seem to have trouble pronouncing it. And so I thought I should call it a simple word like lactovid. And the University of Florida thought that this would be um, good and they decided to trademark it. So why don't I end here and thank everybody that was involved with this work, uh, especially, uh, Leah Reznikoff for securing the funding that, that really got our, our part going, but Chris McCurdy, who um, you know, was 
absolutely key for providing his insight into these signal receptor ligands. Um, and Mike Norris for climbing into what looks like a spacesuit and working in BSL-3 conditions with a deadly virus. So why don't I stop here and uh, see if there are questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Great talk. A great talk and uh, very much fitted, I would say, with the spirit of our webinars. So we see some... Uh, well, we have. Okay, can you see the chat, David? Yes. Okay, is so the, then you can take well, the questions. Yes. Is the mechanism of action, mechanism of diphenhydramine and lactoferrin, direct inhibition of SARS CoV 2 infection? The short answer is, I, I believe, is yes, but the mechanisms themselves are very different, in my opinion. Um, the mechanism of action for lactoferrin, um, you know, there, there are many proposed interactions. Um, some people believe that the mechanism of action of lactoferrin is by, by binding to lipoproteins on the surfaces of cells that could be infected and shielding um, the virus from, from binding to the host cell. Um, there are also thought to be effects on replication. Lactoferrin is thought to inhibit replication of SARS-CoV-2 through mechanisms that are largely unknown. The group in Michigan um, has additional signal transduction interference mechanisms that they believe is the mechanism of action for lactoferrin. For diphenhydramine, um, I, my guess is that it's the sigma receptor binding property of diphenhydramine that is driving its antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2. I hope that helps. You also had a compliment from Victor Romanowski. Did you see it? Ah, thank you. Thank you, Victor. He's, asking, any, he's asking a question. Are there any harmful effects on physiology that could be associated with sigma interacting drugs? I think the short answer is yes. Um, but keep in mind, uh, there is a great diversity of drugs that are able to bind sigma receptors. Um, there are drugs from many different <clears throat> drug classes that are able to bind sigma receptors. And, and Chris McCurdy, I don't, I don't know if we can unmute people, but Chris McCurdy is a sigma receptor expert and he may have insight into the answer to this question too. Um, but that, that's, that's my understanding. It depends on the drug. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, Chris says that was a great answer. <laughs> you see, you receive a number of positive <laughs> chats. <laughs> so I don't know if we have, I have an obvious question. So I sure. apologize in advance for very simplistic, but you see, now we have entered a new era with Paxlovid from Pfizer with, and we uh, and actually within the GVN, we have a number of groups uh, which are also actively working on the direct antiviral. And we, de we do appreciate that we are entering in a new era regarding uh, not only COVID-19, but coronaviruses in general. Have you ever tested the combination of uh, some of the drugs with the antiprotease, you see? Uh, because obviously the mechanisms are apparently at least completely different, but is there any synergistic effect or only an add-on? How would you guess? That is an excellent question and, and, and you know, direction really that I think that people should go in. Um, you know, let's think about it. Let's think about individual drugs and drug combinations. Mm -hmm. There are advantages to drug combinations because just think if, when there's one drug, um, resistance can occur by the organism mutating one gene. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so let's say for like, for example, a protease, um, a protease inhibitor uh, might lend rise to a protease mutation that gives rise to resistance. And which is the reason why it's advantageous to use antiviral drug combinations where the different drugs bind different targets. 
because it's very difficult for a pathogen to <laughs> mutate two different genes to, to, uh, you know, to get around two different drugs. So to my, so, you know, to the short answer to your question is no, we have not tested protease inhibitors plus this combination, but I think that in, in the future, we should, we should be testing double and triple combinations of these agents. And I personally am most interested in diphenhydramine and lactoferrin plus other agents, especially those that are not prescribed if possible. Because mm -hmm. you just think when, when, if the drugs are not prescribed, that means that they have a level of safety that, is, um, that enables clinical uh, exploration to a degree that's not possible with drugs that are prescribed. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Now that's, uh, that would be interesting. And also obviously regarding Paxlovid, there is a point that actually it's a mix and you have Ritonavir, which is included to uh, stabilize actually uh, to uh, the, the protein. So in other words, it's complex regarding uh, uh, interaction between different drugs because actually it's a mix of two already. So. Uh, but that's really, I guess, the direction that, that would be uh, that would be contemplated and uh, and um, others to come, obviously. Thank you very much. I don't know if we have other questions. That's all. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, thank thanks. No, thank you very this. much, David. And if we can be of help as we were alluding to before for uh, uh, providing advice uh, to clinical studies, that's also what the Global Virus Network can uh, provide. I'm telling this also for the other attendees. I mean, really, we, we are here to, to help, to provide contacts, to networking activities. And uh, I really enjoy what you have presented. It's really about serendipity and uh, moving along uh, uncharacterized paths. So that's what science is about. Okay, thank you so much, David. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And as we always keep telling for now two years, be safe. Bye-bye. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye.